This training is on how to handle objections, objections that you might encounter when you're building your business. Before we get into that, let's talk about how not to create objections. And because that's very important also, you might be wondering, well, how would I create an objection? Well, what is the number one objection that you say you get most of the time? Now think about that. You want to know what it is? It's different maybe for everybody. The number one objection that you're going to get is the one you're worrying about and obsessing about the most. And that's because you're putting so much energy into it, it's just got to show up. See, people will dance to the music that you provide. If you're nervous, then they will be nervous. If you think the product is expensive, guess what? So will they. If you're sure that nobody has money to join your business, you will encounter every broke person in the world. If you think it's hard to sponsor, it will be. If you hate to bother people, everyone will be bothered. I call that the gold Lexus SUV phenomenon. Now, in 2000, I bought my first Lexus SUV. It was a beautiful gold car. I loved it. As I was driving it home, I started noticing it everywhere. I must have seen 70 of them on my way home. There's my car. There's my car. There's my car. There's my car. What happened? Was there a run on gold Lexus SUVs? No. It's just that my mindset had changed. I was noticing them. So the same thing happens when we are in the process of sponsoring people, looking for people, recruiting people into our business. Now, let's say that you and I are in my gold Lexus SUV driving down the road with one of your prospects, and we've succeeded in painting a beautiful vista for them, a beautiful vista of success in rain, what that looks like, what healthy lifestyle looks like with Rain's products, and they're going along with it and all of a sudden splat. Along comes a negative question or an objection like a squished bug on that windshield. And even though it's just a tiny little squished bug, that's all the prospect is seeing. You and I can still see the beautiful vista. The prospect only sees the bug. So it's very important to get the windshield wipers going, clear that bug of an objection, and keep moving. So how we respond to that objection is super critical. If we become defensive, that's not a good thing. You know, I am never offended if somebody has a genuine question or an objection. That just means that they're interested enough to bring it up, they're not blowing me off, and I can handle that objection. So it's very important not to become defensive. If we get very insecure, if we become combative or freaked out or homicidal, we're gonna lose that prospect. Now, the number one purpose of handling objections, believe it or not, is not to get people into your business. If you will just understand this concept, it will improve your closing rate. I promise you. And now that may sound counterintuitive, but the number one purpose is to help your prospect get past whatever it is that's stopping them from getting what they want. If they think that your answers are just totally profit motivated for you, if it's all about you, they will stop trusting you and you will lose them. The number one goal is obviously to help them get what they want and you want to do that by educating them, giving them more understanding, giving them enough information to reframe the erroneous belief that they're currently holding about network marketing. So instead of seeing an objection as a threat, I choose to see it as an opportunity. You know, we're in the business of helping the blind to see. Our prospects have blind spots about the opportunity. So it's our job to identify them and to help them get rid of them. You see, we don't see things as they are. We see things as we are. So what I mean by that is we all have experiences, we draw conclusions about those experiences, and then when we have new experiences or new information comes to us, we measure that new information against the experiences that we've already had, right? So some people are going to look at that image on the left and see two people facing each other in profile. Others are going to see the black vase immediately. Some people will look at that image on the right and see a woman's face, while others are going to see a guy with a big nose in profile playing a saxophone. And it really is about the experiences that they've had. And a lot of people have had experiences about network marketing and drawn some false conclusions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some tactics to handle specific situations, but I want to really concentrate on the concepts behind all of it. If you will concentrate on the concepts, Concepts can be applied universally in every situation. So the first concept I want you to take in is that objections are born primarily of fear. The vast majority come from that place. And in my experience, they fall into two categories. Either the prospect has a limiting belief about their own ability to succeed, 
or they have a limiting belief about network marketing's ability to provide what it is that they need. So in either case, the best principle to apply is empathy, how we relate to each other. And the best way to relate to somebody is to help them understand, hey, I am just like you. I had the same challenges, I had the same concerns, the same insecurities and questions, and I overcame them. And it's the best thing I ever did. You see, your story is going to be the nuclear weapon in your arsenal to overcome objections. Your personal story. Share with people your personal journey. Now, if you don't have a story that applies in the situation, find another person in our business that has a story that does. There's hundreds and thousands of stories out there. Stories sell. Facts tell, stories sell. Why do stories sell? Because the prospect places themselves in the story. They see themselves in the story and they start to relate. C.S. Lewis, the famous Anglican theologian, once said, Friendship is born in that moment when one person says to another, What? You too? I thought I was the only one. Think about it. Who are your closest friends? Are they the people who present a facade to you where everything is just perfect in their world and they never let you in? Or are they the people that let you see their warts so that you go, oh, wow, you've got warts? Ah, oh, man, now I can relax because I've got warts too. So we want to be authentic with people and real and share our stories. Now, there's a tactic that's tried and true for expressing empathy and helping people to reframe their, their thinking, and that's called feel, felt, found. And it goes something like this. I completely understand how you feel because, you know, I actually felt the same way, but I have found that blank, blank, blank. Now you give them more information. You tell your story or you share someone else's story that can help give them enough information to reframe their erroneously held belief. Dr. Stephen Covey, in his number one selling book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, said in Habit 5 that we should seek first to understand and only then to be understood. Now, why is that? Well, most people listen in order to reply. Think about it. How many times have you been listening to somebody and while they're talking, you're already getting your reply ready? How much can you truly grasp? Effective communicators don't listen to reply. They listen to understand. So what we want to do is we want to listen closely and fully to the objection. We don't want to interrupt because we've got some snappy answer handy. We just want to listen because many questions and objections contain additional unstated questions and objections. I'll give you an example. I had a guy that was telling me, oh no, I, I just couldn't see myself doing network marketing. I can't, I can't see myself doing that. And he kept saying that until I finally had to ask, well, let me ask you, what is that? that you're talking about? What do you see that as being? And he goes, oh, you know, I'm just not the kind of a guy that can talk to strangers and knock on doors and, and bother people. Well, <laughs> I could help him understand that that's not what we do. I could handle that objection, but I wouldn't have been able to had I not listened clearly to everything that he had to say and asked the right questions. Now, the next thing that you want to do is confirm that you understand. So in that instance, I could have said, so then what I'm hearing is you're concerned because you don't feel comfortable just approaching strangers. You don't want to be going down the street, knocking doors and talking to people. Is that correct? All right. Well, then you validate the prospect, not the objection, the prospect. So I might say to that gentleman, oh, of course, you know, I totally can understand why you would feel that way. Before I knew a lot about network marketing, I sort of felt the same way. But here's the good news. You don't have to knock doors. That's not really how we do the business. And then I could go on to explain how the business is done. But I've validated him. And then I have reframed by giving him examples. I'm going to give him more information about how the business is done. All right. So what would be some of the objections that would show up under the category of limiting beliefs that the prospect holds about his own ability or her own ability to succeed? These are things like, I don't have the money, I don't have the time, I don't have the personality, I'm not the salesperson type, I don't know anybody, I'm new in town, you know, I'm too young, I'm too old, I don't have any experience. Okay, let's take, I don't have the money. Now, you might have a story like this. If you don't, borrow somebody else's story. It's going to be kind of different in every situation, but you could say something like this. I completely understand how you feel because, you know, honestly, I had the same challenge. I didn't have enough money to pay my bills, much less start a business. But you know, then I realized, gosh, you know, I don't have enough money to pay my bills and I don't even have a few hundred dollars to get into something that could be the solution. And it really made me mad. 
And I decided to do something about it. And so I had a garage sale. I raised the money. I got into the business. And let me tell you, it's the best decision I ever made. So let me ask you, if you really felt that this was your chance to take hold of your financial future and control it, do you think you could find a way to make it happen? Okay, let's take another one. Let's take I have no experience. Feel felt found. I completely understand how you feel. You know, when I signed up, I was totally freaked out. I put my kit in the trunk of my car and didn't even think about it for three months because I was so afraid to talk to people. And I just kind of didn't know what to do next. Luckily, I had a good sponsor. And he came to me and he says, Paul, look, you don't have to be an expert to talk to people. And if somebody asks you a question and you don't know the answer to it, there's no shame in saying, hey, you know what? I'm not sure, but I'll find out for you. He says, but you don't even have to run that risk because all you've got to do is hand somebody a video or send somebody a video and then you're going to follow up with me and I'll be answering the questions and then you'll hear what I say and you can learn while you earn. So does that put you more at ease about maybe pursuing this not being an expert? All right. Now let's talk about limiting beliefs that the prospect might hold towards network marketing. What are some of those types of objections? Well, those are things like, I don't like MLMs. I don't want to bother people. Is this one of those pyramid schemes? The top guy makes all the money. Nobody makes any money or I'll lose all my friends. So let's take some of these. Let's take the big daddy. I don't like network marketing. Now, if this shows up with a lot of emotion, I know that there's a 90 plus percent chance that that person has been in network marketing and had a bad experience. All right. Maybe they got into some business, their friend talked them into it, or they thought it was like just buying a ticket in the lottery and they were just going to be rich tomorrow. It didn't happen. So I'm going to try to diffuse some of that anger and I'm going to say, oh my gosh, it sounds like you've got a story. What happened? Were you involved in network marketing before? Then just let them talk. When they talk, it starts to take all the power and all the air out of it. They feel better about it. And they're going to parade in front of you all of the mistaken beliefs that they hold about network marketing and also probably some of the mistakes that they made. So then you can handle those objections one at a time. One of the things that shows up a lot for me is people say, oh yeah, you know, I was in network marketing, but I just promised myself never again. So if somebody says that, I'm going to feel felt found them, I completely see why you'd feel that way. You know, if I had gone through that, I, I most likely would feel absolutely the same way. But let me ask you, do you think that you owe it to yourself to look at every business opportunity for its own unique variables? Because certain businesses have their advantages over others. They're not all cookie cutter and exactly alike. And just concluding I'm never looking again is like eating in a restaurant, having a bad plate of spaghetti. And then saying, you know, I'm never eating in a restaurant again. All restaurants are bad. And of course, you can see that that might be taking it a little bit too far. So if I could show you some of the unique variables about this business, do you think that you'd be open to listening? All right. Now, if it doesn't show up with a lot of emotion, if they just say, well, you know, I don't like network marketing, then I'm going to ask them, well, tell me, do you mind me asking, what is it about network marketing that you find distasteful? Or what is it that you don't like? What you'll find after that is they're going to parade in front of you, once again, a bunch of erroneous beliefs, a bunch of false conclusions that they've drawn about a fabulous industry, but because they've had some bad experiences, they think that that defines the industry. And usually it's because they've had a visit from whom I call Uncle Clueless, <laughs> okay? So this is somebody who went to an opportunity meeting, got all excited, signed an application, and they show up on your doorstep, and they've got goals, they've got dreams, and you are joining their business whether it kills them or you. So they sell, sell, sell you. They make all kinds of exaggerated claims about the product. Man, you're going to sprout wings and fly and think of all the money you'll save on gas. Or they promise you that you'll be rich next month and you won't have to do much work. I'll do it all for you. If that doesn't work, they just start twisting the arm a little bit, manipulating just a tad or guilting you into it because after all, you owe them. Or they just flat out start begging you. But let me ask you, when that happened to you, how did that leave you feeling? And honestly, would you ever do that to anybody else? Of course not, because you're a nice person. And most people in the world are nice people and they, they just wouldn't do that. But here's the irony. Network marketing is premised on my ability to get you to do to somebody else what I just did to you. That's the whole thing. So if what I did to you was icky, you won't do it because nobody wants to do what this guy just did. Because if they did, their neighbors would run in the house and lock their doors when they saw them. They'd avoid them at parties and they'd call everybody and warn them about us, right? So we don't want to do that. 
But here's the thing, network marketing is a $180 billion a year industry. Just a few years ago, like five years ago, it was a $150 billion a year industry. It keeps growing. It simply would not do that. It could not grow if it was based on annoying everyone around you. So there has to be a professional way to do this and an unprofessional way to do this. Most people encounter the unprofessional way to do it. Why have so many people had that visit from Uncle Clueless? Well, you know, network marketing products are exciting. Network marketing opportunities are exciting. And there is no particular education level or certification that's required to do it. If you're 18 and excited, you can sign an application. And unless you get the training that you need, then the scenario of disaster ensues. Unsuspecting Mr. Prospect is walking down the street, minding his own business, when along comes excited Mr. New Distributor, and without any regard to the prospect's timing, without creating any rapport, without knowing anything about this person, without understanding what his own goals or dreams or wants or desires might be, excited distributor just starts puking information all over the prospect, and it's just like vomiting your business all over that person, and it usually doesn't go very well. And then what happens is that prospect walks away from that interaction thinking, I have just experienced, quote, network marketing, end quote. And I hate it, and I never want to do it. When in reality, they haven't experienced network marketing. They've just experienced a very well-meaning, uneducated, unprofessional person who thinks they're doing something approximating network marketing, and they're not. I always marvel that people think they can do that. If you think about it, you know, it takes four years to get a bachelor's degree to qualify for certain careers. This is a career in which you can literally earn millions of dollars, even millions of dollars a year, and have an international business. So why would you think you need zero education? Thinking about it that way would be like me just deciding tomorrow, you know what, I'm a pilot. I just decided I am, so I'm going to go down to Delta. I'm going to hop in a 747 and start pushing buttons. <laughs> well, we all know how that would turn out, right? Well, it's similar in network marketing. You don't have to go through four years of college to do it, but you do have to learn the basics. Your company will teach that to you. Your upline will teach that to you. And there are wonderful books that you can read by experienced network marketers. So follow people who've already been successful at what it is that you want to do. So let's take some of these objections. Let's take, uh, is this one of those pyramid schemes? Well, when I get that objection, I like to clarify by asking, well, let me ask you, what do you mean by that? They're going to mean one of two things. They're either going to mean, well, you know, it's that kind of a deal where the guy at the top makes all the money and everybody else is just like a little peon. Or they mean, oh, you know, that's one of those dodgy, scammy, kind of illegal deals, right? Well, let's take the guy at the top makes all the money first. So somebody who holds that belief believes that your position is most important. The first guy in is always going to make the most money. I'm going to ask them a couple of questions. First of all, what is that guy on top of? And how'd he get there? Well, obviously, it's a business that he built. Would you agree that he's entitled to benefit from a business that he built? You know, I can totally understand why you might look at this and say, well, that's a pyramid. Because when I first looked at it, that's what it looked like to me. I felt exactly the same way. I said, well, now, if the sales volume flows all the way up all the time, then the guy who's at the top is always going to make the most money. But would it surprise you to know that there was somebody on my third level, even though I made millions of dollars, who made a million dollars more than me? That's a true story. So then position can't be what determines pay. You know what determines pay? Activity. If you can be more effective at driving more volume in a more balanced fashion through your personal business, you can make more money than the person who brought you into the business. And that's fair. And even though it looks like a pyramid, when you look at it as a chart of an organization, what you have to understand are pyramids are some of the most stable structures in the world. Why do you think the pyramids in Giza are still standing thousands and thousands and thousands of years later? So don't let that bother you because your family is a pyramid. Your church is a pyramid. Your school is a pyramid. And certainly, if you have a job in a corporation, your corporation is a pyramid. How many CEOs are there? One. How many hardworking employees are there? Tons and tons and tons, with virtually no chance of ever becoming the CEO. You know, the average CEO in America earns $10 million a year. The average worker in America earns $29,000 a year. So, no thanks. Sounds like a pyramid scheme to me. <laughs> If you really want to talk about pyramids and network marketing, network marketing is more like an inverted pyramid. 
because everybody starts at the bottom from zero. But there's room at the top for everybody. Everybody can be the CEO and everybody can surpass in income the person who enrolled them. And that's fair. It's also a very moral business model because your success is my success. I cannot be successful in my business if you're in my business and you're not successful. I have to help you be successful in order to assure my own success. Now, you're not going to see that in corporate America. If you're the new guy in the department, nobody applauds when you walk in. It's not like, oh, yay, Paul's here. Let's help him get the promotion. I'm their competition. They want the promotion. In network marketing, that's the first thing people say. Oh, great, Paul's the new guy. Let's help him get the promotion. Because if I get the promotion, so do all of them. Now, let's take the belief that somehow network marketing is a dodgy, scammy, illegal business model. Well, there are pyramid schemes out there. They're very different than legitimate network marketing businesses. Pyramid schemes can look like network marketing, but there's a vast difference. In a pyramid scheme, the product is the money. You pay just to participate. You're privileged to be in the game so you can make money. It's buying a lottery ticket, kind of. You're paid for recruiting people. Since there really isn't a product, you get money because you brought somebody in. Your position in the organization absolutely determines your pay. A pyramid scheme promises big dollars for very little effort. A legitimate network marketing business has legitimate products that sell within the network and also outside of the network to customers. You are not paid for recruiting. You are paid because product consumption happens. People are using the product on a repetitive basis and those sales are accrued to your account and you receive a percentage of those sales. You can out earn your sponsor in a legitimate network marketing business and it requires real and consistent effort. It is not a get rich quick scheme. Additionally, you might want to consider that network marketing is legal in the United States and in more than 70 countries around the world and it's been upheld in both state and federal courts for more than 50 years. Now, another objection that you're going to get, and this one is related to the pyramid scheme, is the idea of saturation. They're thinking, you know, I'm not the first guy in, right? So they think saturation is going to happen. It kind of goes like this. Well, if network marketing really works, then everybody would join. And the last guy in would always get hurt, and then there'd be nobody else to talk to. Think about how silly that is. I mean, there are 30-year-old and 50-year-old network marketing companies with millions and millions of members, and you're not one of them. And neither are 6 billion plus other people. So saturation is really never going to happen statistically. I've been a full-time network marketer for 13 years, and although I've made millions of dollars, I'm still trying to saturate my own cul-de-sac, okay? <laughs> You also might want to consider a really great leader who personally sponsored 12 other fabulous leaders and they've been holding weekly opportunity meetings and one-on-ones for 2,000 plus years and they still haven't gotten everyone to join. Okay, let's take another objection. You know, I just don't have the time. Well, you know, I can understand how you feel. I actually felt kind of the same way myself, but what I found is that I could fit the business into the corners of my life. How many times have you recommended a book or a movie or a lawyer or a restaurant? How much time did that take you? And did you get paid for it? Well, that's network marketing. That's really all we do. So if you're out to lunch with somebody, you can tell them about the product. You can share it in the daily course of your life. And technology makes that so much simpler. Our company has a phone app and all you have to do is tap it and you can share a video by text with anyone, anytime, anywhere in the world at the speed of thought. So it's very, very easy and you can fit it into the corners of your life. Now, another question that I like to ask them is, well, let me ask you, if time were not an issue, what things that you love, that you're passionate about, would you be doing now, which you can't do now? People love to talk about what they're passionate about. So they'll tell you. Then I'm going to ask them, well, why can't you spend more time doing that? They're going to educate me on the fact that somebody else owns a lot of their time. So then I'm going to validate the prospect and say, well, you know, you're absolutely right. That's what most people's days look like. After all, there's only 24 hours in a day, so most people spend eight hours sleeping. And I don't imagine you want to cut down on your sleep. And then they spend eight hours working. And I imagine you can't just walk away from your job right now. And then they have eight hours to do everything else, whether that's spending time with their family, shopping, doing their bills, cleaning their house, commuting back and forth to work. 
that's the time they've got to do it. Well, what if I could show you how by fitting the business into the corners of your life during that time, you could actually wind up buying back some of those eight hours working. Because if you can leverage the time and efforts of other people, that starts to give you income on a residual basis. And then you have freedom and you have choices. Now, I'll tell you what happened for me. I started in my network marketing business very part-time. I figured I would work full-time at my job and part-time at my fortune. I knew network marketing could provide a residual income, and that was attractive to me. And after a year and a half working in my network marketing business, my income in network marketing surpassed my income at my full-time job. And at that point, I was able to say to my family, hey, you know what? Let's take off. Let's go to South America. We were gone for three weeks, and while I was gone, the check kept coming. And as a matter of fact, my income went up by five figures that month. How is that possible? Because I had shown other people how to fit the business into the corners of their life. And they were showing others how to do the same thing and using a very simple system. And at that point, you just couldn't stop it. It was like a snowball rolling itself down the hill. So does that sound attractive to you? All right. Now, let's take the next objection. Ah, you know, geez, I'm just not a good salesperson. I like to have a little fun with this. And at that point, I say, well, thank heavens, because if you were, I'd have to beat it out of you. It might surprise you to know that network marketing is not full of slick salespeople. Network marketers come from every walk of life. All kinds of people work part-time in network marketing. As a matter of fact, the number one most represented profession inside of the profession of network marketing is teachers. And that makes a lot of sense to me because teachers are already trained to do what we train people to do, which is to just put an important message in front of them in a clear fashion and then allow the prospect to choose if and how it serves them and at what level. See, we're not in the business of convincing people. We're simply looking for people who are looking for what we have. Now, the number one mistake that distributors make once they've handled the I'm not a good salesman objection is they keep talking. For instance, you've been to a presentation, you're sitting there with your prospect, it's over, and instead of simply asking for a close, so Bob, tell me, on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being I'm not interested and 10 being, hey, let me get out my pen, I'm ready to sign that application, where do you think you find yourself? Instead of doing that, they keep talking. And they say, oh, now let me just tell you this one more thing. Oh, and let me tell you about this. And then there's science about this. And let me tell you about that. And really what they're feeling is uncomfortable. They don't want to ask for the clothes. So they're thinking, man, if I can just give him one more magic fact, he's going to jump at me and say, that's it. I'm in. But that doesn't normally happen. So you have to ask for the clothes. And if you keep talking, the prospect thinks, well, gee, Paul told me I didn't have to be a good salesman, but he's sitting here selling me. So don't do that. Just ask simply for the close. All right, let's take another one. That's too expensive. Now, the concept to apply here is compared to what? Because there's price and there's value. We have to help people understand the value. So if somebody says, I think that's expensive for that product, I might say, you know what? I completely get where you're coming from. Because when I first looked at it, I thought, well, maybe that's a little bit pricey. But then I realized that soul is like the equivalent of 7 to 10 servings of fruits and vegetables. And doctors tell us to get that. Most people don't. But what would it cost to get 7 to 10 servings of fruits and vegetables on a daily basis? Soul is also the equivalent of 3 to 4 servings of healthy fatty acids. What would that cost? You know, I have a brother-in-law, Larry King, who sells essential fatty acids on TV, tablets, and for a month's supply, it's $49 at half price. So my goodness, this is becoming a bargain, isn't it? Also, I'm feeling great. I'm not visiting the doctor as often, so I'm saving money there. To me, Soul is a tremendous value, and what if I could show you how to get your product for free every month? We have this thing called Rain Partner Teams. Now, if they say, well, that's a lot of money to start a business, I'm going to compare it to franchises. You know, the average franchise costs 20000 at least to over 100000 Some franchises are in the millions. And how long would it take to pay that back? So network marketing is a bargain because you can create an international business with no employees and no overhead costs. And you can break even the next week. All right, let's take the next one. I'll run out of people to talk to, or gee, I just don't know a lot of people. You know, I felt the same way when I first got into network marketing. I thought, man, I'm going to have to recruit thousands of people to make this business significant like it needs to be. But if you talk to successful network marketers who've made a lot of money, and I've made millions of dollars in this industry, 
All of us will tell you that it was two to four key people in our business that were pretty much responsible for exploding our business. So it doesn't take thousands of people, it just takes a few of the right people. And you know, I looked at my cell phone and I started realizing, well, gee whiz, I got a lot of contacts in that phone. And then I looked at Facebook and realized I had contacts in Facebook. Hey, pull out your phone. Let's see how many contacts you have. Let's look at Facebook. How many friends do you have? And you can drive home the point that the contacts don't have to be local because technology allows us to communicate with people really anywhere for pennies. Sociologists tell us that the average person knows 250 people by name. How do they know that? Well, the average wedding is attended by 250 people. So is the average funeral. So when you sponsor just one person, you're not just sponsoring that one person, you're sponsoring him or her and all 250 of their contacts as possibilities. When they sponsor somebody, that person comes in with 250 people as possibilities that they know also. So do you really think that you could ever run out of people to talk to? Well, I certainly hope that you now feel the importance of completely listening to your prospect, understanding their true question or objection, expressing empathy, and then giving them more information in the form of a story to help them reframe their thinking about that subject. I hope you felt that this was a good use of your time, because I've certainly found these principles to be very valuable in my business. Thank you for listening. Now go out and make it rain.